Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to wait a few minutes so that we can let all of our participants that registered um, get off the waiting room and join us in our Zoom world, in our Zoom room. So we'll wait just a few seconds and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the first panel of this four panel webinar series that we are co hosting. I'm Dr. Teresa Garate. I'm the Senior Vice President for Strategic Partnerships and Engagement for the Gateway Foundation. And this webinar series is being is a partnership between four um, organizations in the state uh, Gateway, the Midwest Asian Health Association, TASC, and the Way Back In. So as we enter the last week of Problem Gambling Awareness Month, March, uh, we'd like to say we save the best for last, but not really. All month we have been doing as a network of providers, community outreach and education to educate the public about the need to focus on treatment for people with a gambling disorder. And so this week, as we go into the last week, we are offering a number of these panels. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by some of our elected officials as well as the director for the Division of Substance Use Prevention and Recovery to have a conversation about how this is a public health issue that we must all be very aware about and work together to ensure that people are healthy and safe and not hurt by gambling disorders. So um, I think just for logistics, um, if you are a participant um, and you have a question, um, you can put it into the chat box. Um, I have a trustee assistant helping with that. We do wanna hear your questions and we'll do the best to, to answer them. Um, I hope that soon uh, Senator Kimberly Lightfoot will be, will be joining us. Um, Senator Collins was supposed to be with us and had um, another commitment, so she's not able to be here. Um, so my apologies on that, uh, but I am sure we're still gonna have a very robust dialogue. Um, Dana, did I miss any? Oh, Senator Lightfoot just said she's here. Um, Dana, uh, maybe she's in as a participant instead of a panelist. Can you work, I'll work on getting her? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Senator Lightfoot, hold tight and uh, we will get try to get you on camera in a few minutes. Um, you know, I always start off by saying sorry for technical difficulties, but as everyone knows, this has been our world for the last year. So we have learned to all be very patient with each other. Um, okay, so. Um, Today, we're really gonna have a discussion about the role of government in this field, in this area, and understanding that problem gambling is a problem um, and that it is uh, getting to be a bigger problem, especially here in Illinois with all of the opportunities. So to kick us off, I'd like to invite Director Jones, um, who joined uh, the state last fall in the midst of a pandemic. Fun times. Um, I'll have him introduce himself and then talk a little bit about, if you can, sort of the problem gambling awareness program that is administered by your division um, at the Department of Human Services, and also the study that we just, that you all just commissioned um, to learn more about this public health issue. With that, Director Jones, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dr. Garati, and um, also certainly uh, thanks uh, Gateway uh, for holding uh, this vital forum where uh, legislators um, and as Dr. Garati mentioned, the state have an opportunity uh, to discuss uh, the, I think I would say even the broader disease of addiction and then specifically around uh, gambling and gambling use disorder. Uh, again, just to reintroduce myself as uh, Dr. Garati indicated I am uh, David T. Jones with the Department of Human Services, um, the Director for the Division of Substance Use Prevention and Recovery. Uh, we certainly understand that uh, gambling use disorder uh, is an addiction similar to uh, an addiction of uh, alcohol or other substances. And uh, DHS appreciates the opportunity to provide information about the disease of addiction, both to help reduce the stigma associated with addiction and to inform Illinoisans about treatment services uh, and support assistance available to address uh, gambling use disorder. I'll um, 
I'll, I'll speak a little a bit about uh, some of the services uh, that uh, DHS Supra uh, supports. We work to expand prevention, treatment, and recovery services for individuals who have a gambling disorder. And we certainly are committed to ensuring that uh, quality services are available for all individuals seeking treatment for gambling disorder, including populations that may be more vulnerable or may have been more historically marginalized due to race, culture, economic, or social disparities. Um, through our network of providers, which certainly includes a Gateway, um, the Way Back In, Task, and others, uh, they uh, provide treatment uh, services and support. Uh, Super also partners with providers to, gen to generate training and technical assistance uh, to better address um, gambling disorder. And then we are very much um, invested in expanding the number of organizations in the state who can provide a gambling disorder treatment. And uh, as Dr. Grady uh, asked about the kind of the gambling assessment that's underway, if I, if you all will bear with me for just a moment, I just wanted to, um, I'm going to quickly share um, my screen to um, walk through um, just kind of really the the uh, what's what's involved in that. Um, gambling assessment. So really the purpose is to uh, attain the, the kind of prevalence of, of gambling generally and to understand the extent to which uh, problem or compulsive gambling is uh, impacting uh, Illinoisans. We, the, we had aimed to um, survey at least, uh, you know, 2,000 uh, Illinoisans and um, there are, the survey was about, uh, consisted of taking, uh, it was like 15 minutes or so. Um, it was both, it was issued telephonically and um, also online. And um, people had the opportunity to complete that through uh, February and March, we just wrapped it up. And what we're hoping and what we feel certain is that it'll be, it is the first statewide estimate of the various gambling behaviors uh, in Illinois. Um, it will inform, if you will, um, a broader kind of strategic um, effort uh, so that we have a really a good sense as to what's happening around uh, gambling in Illinois, both in terms of uh, perception and then what some of the um, challenges uh, actually are. It will serve as a baseline for um, for conducting this work, I think for uh, years to come, and it will give us um, more advanced uh, analytics as it pertains to uh, gambling. Um, we have it included um, a pretty uh, significant uh, literature uh, search around um, to get information about populations. There was also an environmental scan and document review. That is that we obtained information from um, uh, nationally as well as other states who are engaging in processes to uh, certainly benefit from uh, their lessons learned. Um, it included discussions with um, people who, uh, for example, uh, senators and uh, representatives um, at the state as, as well as uh, local level uh, stakeholders, inclusive of providers, uh, families, uh, people who are doing the work on the ground, um, special populations. And then there was an, an even more pointed targeted survey for people who are kind of uh, self-professed um, uh, gamblers and are going through kind of that challenge now. We um, understand that um, we, uh, are very interested in collaborating with kind of a, a broader group of stakeholders uh, to develop what we hope will be um, a really a comprehensive plan. There will be a, a report that comes from the survey. Uh, we know that we have been, as I mentioned, focused on providing treatment through the provider network, but it's also important to consider all aspects of addressing uh, problem gambling. So the prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery um, we um, anticipate, particularly as we 
think about the younger population that there will be the need to get uh, more upstream and then for there to be likely a broader public education campaign. Um, again, some that gets at the stigma that prevents people from uh, being uh, willing to approach and, and seek uh, treatment for the gambling disorder. And then uh, finally, I think it will help us to determine the scale and capacity needed uh, to train clinicians and people with lived experience to uh, mitigate against gambling disorder. And so I will stop there, Dr. Grady, and, and turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, Director Jones. I think Senator, Le there she is. <laughs> awesome. Welcome, Senator. And I see you figured out how to do your background. So it looks like you're in our capital, <laughs> our state's capital, which we all miss. Good morning. Uh, Thank you. And I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Stoudelman. Hello, <laughs> gentlemen, everyone. Um, I am not the best with this, but I promise I was I was here, but I just could not be with no you. No worries, no worries. So you didn't miss much and you, you heard D Director Jones. So I'm gonna kind of follow our run of show, give you a minute to get settled and everybody will have an opportunity to introduce themselves. So my next question, and thank you, Director Jones. I think that gives a good foundation uh, really of why this study is so important. I've been um, talking to a lot of reporters this month about how our best intentions sometimes target communities that are most in need. So really understanding what we're doing as we roll out opportunities for healthy, fun gambling and also balance that with the public health issues of some of our most needy communities in Illinois. So thank you for that. And I know we'll hear more about the study, but I wanted to give Representative Winhorst and uh, Senator Stadelman an opportunity to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their districts. And you know, both of your districts are outside of Chicago proper, or Chicago land. And what we see in the state, and when I drive the state, and I used to drive it a lot more, um, you know, we see the gambling, the video gaming terminals everywhere, and it, it feels like they're very focused in our rural communities. So, wanted to give you both an opportunity to again introduce yourselves, talk about your districts, and then kind of what you're seeing in your communities and what you think we together as a state and as partners can do to make sure that. Um, we help people and uh, focus on prevention. Um, how about we start with Senator Salomon, just from alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. And uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate Senator Lightford's uh, background as well. I, I just wish I had those cool glasses that she did, though, but uh, I'll need to correct that next time. So nice to see everybody. Uh, I am State Senator Steve Stottleman. I would also like to uh, Thank Gateway for hosting this important discussion as uh, gaming has expanded in our state. As uh, many of you may know, Rockford is, is actually one of the six locations that will get a casino following the passage of gaming expansion now almost two years ago. So, you know, the issues that are being discussed today are very relevant to what's happening in this area. And, you know, we certainly need to make sure that treatment and services are available for people who do have an addiction problem. But I also believe there's just a certain percentage of the population that likes to gamble as their entertainment option. And if they don't gamble in Illinois, they'll travel across the state line and find other ways to gamble. You know, here in Northern Illinois, there are bus trips planned all the time to casinos in Wisconsin, Iowa, or Indiana. And so instead of people spending their money to improve roads and schools in those other states, why not keep them here and allow entertainment options here? And, you know, just last week, as a matter of fact, Wisconsin, announced plans uh, that they were moving forward for a new casino, shopping, and major water park complex right across the state border. Guess where those customers will come from? Northern Illinois. So if there are additional social issues which we need to address, we'll still have to deal with them without um, any revenue. Um, you know, you mentioned the fact of the uh, video gaming terminals. And um, obviously before, you know, plans were announced for Rockford to get a, a you know, a casino, um, Rockford has had a large number of, of video gaming terminals, but you know, I kind of think it's, it's reaching a, a, a saturation point. Um, as, uh, as I've indicated, I think there's a, a certain percentage of the population that likes to gamble and that limits the number of locations that will open. And I think municipalities, at least around here, are concerned about aesthetics. They want to make sure there's not a gaming venue in every corner. And I think you know, the limit of people that do gamble, I think that will prevent more openings. And so I think we're, we're getting to the point where we're seeing a saturation point. 
Um, and who knows, once the casino opens, I think there may be a lovely off or drop in VGT play. You know, when video gaming was approved more than 10 years ago, uh, casinos saw a drop in customers. So, um, you know, I think, you know, be interesting what the future holds now the casinos coming to Rockford and what impact will have on VGTs. But um, I guess I just would like to see the entertainment option here, but make sure we provide, you know, addiction treatment and services. That would be a, a key, a key role here. Thank you. Those are some great points, you know, and it did say um, there's healthy ways to engage with all of these things. We just have to be very aware of making sure that it doesn't get to the unhealthy part. Uh, Representative Whithurst. Yes, uh, I also want to thank Gateway for hosting uh, this event and, and allowing me to be a participant. I, I appreciate this opportunity. My name is Patrick Windhorst. I'm state representative in the 118th district, which is in ex deep southern Illinois, so far the south house district uh, in the state. It's rural. It has all or parts of 11 counties. Um, for myself, I uh, live in Metropolis, which is on the Ohio River across from Paducah, Kentucky. I've lived there basically my entire life. Uh, since the early 90s, Metropolis has, has had a casino uh, in our town, which has uh, initially been a source of some controversy, but has since that time become uh, just accepted as part of our, our city and, and our culture. Uh, I I'm in my second term as a state representative. So my based my first year in Springfield, the gambling expansion uh, passed, I got to witness uh, that process of, from the chamber and see how that all uh, played out. But prior to serving in the General Assembly, I served as state's attorney in my home county for 14 years, uh, which uh, led me to actually deal with the casino uh, on a more professional level and uh, see how the Illinois Gaming Board works within casinos, regulations that exist with casinos, and then seeing video gaming expand um, in 2009 or so when that occurred or after the law passed and seeing the differences between the regulations and uh, the oversight that occurred with video gaming versus casinos. Um, things such as self-exclusion list and how that is enforced at casinos versus video gaming uh, terminals and uh, just the availability of IGB agents, of course, at a casino versus not being present at all the, the locations that have uh, VGTs. Like most districts uh, in the state, there are VGTs throughout my district. Um, in fact, it's so common now, it, you don't even notice them. There, there's so many, it just kind of uh, blends into the landscape, uh, so to speak. Uh, and with that, I think as uh, Senator Stottleman said, we have seen uh, a saturation point. Uh, you know, I, One of the stories when people ask me about VGTs that, that I tell is that I'm aware of businesses that uh, not only in my town, but you know, throughout the district that have applied for liquor licenses, not because they wanted to sell liquor. In fact, they don't engage in selling liquor. They just wanted the liquor license so they could have the VGTs. So that has uh, created a situation where a lot of businesses are relying on those VGTs just uh, to maintain operations. Um, so with that, with that ubiquity, I guess, comes a societal cost uh, that we are now having to, to deal with. And we need to have the, the treatment services available. Uh, they aren't as available in Southern Illinois for um, more common uh, treat, types of treatment. Uh, drug and alcohol treatment are, are hard to come by here and even harder, of course, is gambling addiction or gaming addiction. So I do think that uh, we need to make sure we're expanding those efforts at prevention and treatment and addressing those needs uh, as we move forward. But again, thank you for having me and uh, look forward to this discussion. was muted. Thank you both. I'm going to come back with some follow-up questions, but before I do that, I wanted to give Senator Lightford the opportunity to talk a little bit about her district, and she actually has one of our biggest advocates around gambling addiction within her district, my colleague Anita Pindur, who is the executive director for The Way Back In. They have been doing gambling addiction services for a really long time. Gateway is a little bit new to the New to this game, not new to addiction, but new to this one. And so we've been very fortunate to learn from Anita. But, you know, in your district, Senator, you have the way back in, but there are still many gaps. So talk a little bit about kind of your district and what you see the needs are and, you know, what, what we can do to help you, what you can do with Director Jones to try to close some of those gaps. 
Great. Thanks again for having me during uh, Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Um, it's important that Gateway and the Way Back In continue to do informative sessions such as this. Um, I, I'm Senate Majority Leader Kimberly Lightford. I've been representing the 4th Senate District for almost 23 years. Um, I've had the pleasure of partnering with the Way Back In, and especially during that last vote we just did on gambling, I'm sharing with them some of the ideas and resources that the state um, ought to put forth or has been putting forth, and also letting them know that during the negotiations, it was critical that we identified our resources to go to assist with um, gambling and addiction. So my community is pretty much compri comprised of several villages and townships within Proviso Township um, and also the West Side Austin community. Um, and um, it's, it's a very diverse community. I, I share the same sentiments as my colleagues here. Um, many people see it as a form of just um, something to do, if you will. They enjoy it. Some people use it just for um, extracurricular activities. But then there are so many people who um, become addicted um, by um, gambling, which um, it puts them in a position where they're vulnerable and losing their homes and um, their cars and just all of their resources, their life savings for some. And then for me, I think what's one of the most important is they lose their dignity. And at that point, it's chasing the resources to try to make up for the lost. And so I think it's important that education and, and awareness um, is one of the most important things to note that we ought to do as a legislative body to make sure that individuals are aware of the signs of gambling disorders. Um, and if they know someone who has a gambling addiction or they feel that they are developing a gambling addiction, that they should know exactly where they can go to get help. So when I look at the Department of Human Services, um, they have a division of substance abuse, uh, substance use prevention and recovery, and they launched this We Know the Feeling Dot Org, um, which is a new site that they can um, help people um, get support and advice um, to residents about different gambling disorders. Um, they also have the 1 800 Gambler. Um, number that you can call and you can actually text them too, to to ILGAMB253342. And so I just want to make sure that just during this month, um, they're looking to find ways and partner with community organizations um, to define gambling disorders as an addiction, to highlight the importance of ending stigmas to ensure people get access treatment. I think that's one of the big things. It's like, oh, I don't want anyone to know that this is a problem for me um, because I don't want to be labeled a gambler and they're not getting the necessary supports that they need. So we need to inform people and help them to remove that stigma, um, provide practical information on how to access treatment services. And then the department is also looking at ways to provide a look into how members of the General Assembly and the department are working together to ensure that the resources are available. We are in a crisis year um, with finances, um, but I think, as we all know, the importance of substance abuse uh, addiction as well as gambling addictions and all addictions that we have a responsibility to put those needed resources um, in the Department of Human Services budget, uh, specifically in the Division of um, Prevention and Recovery um, and so forth. Thank you, Senator. So now, you know, I had a couple more questions, but you've all touched on this and, and it's sort of the balance between doing something people enjoy in a healthy way making sure that our state benefits from the resources that come to it, and then also very much focused on a public health response um, with prevention. So I'm wondering, maybe Director Jones or anybody who wants to jump in, you know, what collaboration is there currently? And those of you who know me may know that I served as the Assistant Director for the Illinois Department of Public Health under Governor Quinn from 2009 to 2012. So public health is very much a part of my perspective and who I am. But you know, we, we have the Department of Human Services, the Division of Substance Use Prevention and Recovery, but we also have the Gaming Board and we also have public health. And I wonder, 
if there's maybe Director Jones is the best person to talk about this, you know, what is the collaboration or is there any collaboration between those agencies to address this issue uh, statewide and make sure that we are we have the right balance? Do you, can you speak to that a little bit, Director Jones? I didn't, I didn't prep you for that one. So that's totally like a on the fly. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Grady. And, and, and before I you know, kind of speak to those kind of uh, global uh, partnerships, I, I, I do want to just you know, thank the other panelists uh, for uh, their comments, in particular, uh, Senator uh, Leifert around um, uh, making sure that uh, you know, she mentioned uh, the, um, the campaigns that are, are happening, uh, the We Know the feeling a website along with the 1-800 gambler number and the, and the texting, I know that, that it's critical that um, people know that, that um, those resources are available so that they um, can access them and get information generally just about kind of gambling. And then if they are you know, in, in need of or, or feel that they may have some challenges in that it, uh, the gambling behavior is beginning to impact their daily lives in, in, in really negative ways that they can go and take kind of a, an anonymous screen. And so just going to underscore that and, and just, you know, I'm, I'm going to partner with uh, Senator Lightford and take her on the road because that, the advertisement couldn't have been any better. So, I, so you know, thumbs up there. And then um, uh, to your, your question, uh, Dr. Reddy, absolutely. We, you know, the, the partnership with, uh, with public health. And I think that um, also, it, it, another uh, really important partner, in addition to uh, you all as providers for us, because you know you are the ones who are making a difference in terms of connecting with people. You know when the behavior kind of crosses over to a point where it it, it is uh, you know diagnosable, and and, um, and and there really are challenges with in terms of how folks are are, are living. That you're the ones that are able to provide. Uh, that that uh, all important treatment. I think that um, there are a number of people though with lived experience, and so whether you're talking about you know um, Southern Illinois, Rockford, or that uh, it's those those partnerships with people with lived experience that we also want to make sure that we're getting the information to, so that they can say to uh, their friends, family, and neighbors, you know, here's here's what's available. They, you know, that there in fact are some re resources that you can access uh, to partner. And then I think that, you know, with, with public health, again, you know, we are taking kind of that, that broader population health approach to say, so let's also focus on helping to keep people well. And so um, in their wellness, uh, here are, you know, here's what we're doing to reinforce information to, to really provide that, that ongoing support, those messages around prevention and then and what works. And then um, in terms of the uh, Illinois Gaming Board, they actually are uh, the ones that are taking the lead um, for, on, on establishing kind of policy and the like. And so, you know, we are trying to make sure that we're coordinating with them as much as possible to give them information around, again, the, the um, the broader uh, disease of addiction, but then even more specifically, um, how to, to help people so that uh, it actually doesn't get to a point where it becomes a gambling use disorder and that you know, people are um, util utilizing it more for uh, leisure, but then being real clear about kind of, if you will, not crossing that line. Thank you, Director Jones. Um, does anybody else want to comment on that? I was going to go into another question, but I wasn't sure if anybody else wanted to make a comment on that. Senator Saddleman, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> you think a year of doing this, I would uh, get this down. But uh, I guess I would just add from a legislative perspective, I think the one thing we can do, and I think uh, Leader Lightford mentioned it, was making sure that funding is available during the first gaming expansion. I don't think the state did a, a really good job I believe there was like $1.5 million allocated uh, more than 10 years ago. And um, that was money promised for addiction services. I don't know if the state ever got close to spending that amount. With this most recent gaming expansion, I think the state budgeted nearly $7 million every year to fund programs and to help people cope with their habit. And that's up from like $800,000 a year. That's a huge increase. And of course, we got to make sure that money is spent. But I think hopefully there's a commitment this time around to make sure 
funding for those services that have been mentioned are there uh, from uh, when it comes to uh, figuring out a budget every year. That's a great point. And actually, you know, um, we applied, I submitted the application for this program during the pandemic in April. And because Gateway is so large and we're statewide, we actually got a pretty big grant, which allows us to reach those hard to reach areas because Representative Windhorst alluded to it in some of our communities, there's nothing, you know, not just gambling. There's really a lot of big, you know, there's these deserts of medication assisted treatment, treatment, et cetera. So one of the things that we've been doing is providing gambling disorder treatment services virtually through telehealth. And right now, um, you know, there's many of us who are very worried about what's going to happen to telehealth. Our commercial insurance company is still going to pay for it. Is Medicaid still going to pay for it during the pandemic and the governor's executive orders? All of us, all providers have been able to offer group therapy, one-on-one -on -one counseling. We've launched our um, gambling disorder services program virtually. So I wonder if you all could talk a little bit, I think more from the General Assembly, what you see happening in telehealth. And, um, you know, there's a bill that uh, Deb Conroy has right now. And, you know, there's a lot of things happening there. But we as providers think that that needs to continue. I um, was wondering if you could share some perspectives on that. I could touch on that uh, maybe just briefly. I, it, it appears to me that there is bipartisan support uh, to continue telehealth. Obviously, areas of uh, rural areas of Illinois that tend to be, uh, at least right now, represented by Republicans, not to put too much of a political point on it, and that benefits our areas. And it seems that those who are leading the charge in the bill are on uh, the Democratic side of the aisle. So uh, I, I'm optimistic. Um, of course, being in the minority party may not be in the best place to, to say what will uh, happen or move forward. But um, I know in my conversations with members of the General Assembly, there seems to be um, a pretty universal feeling that this is something we'd like to see continued and uh, expand where we can. I could add to that, that, you know, the telehealth is really important. And I would even roll it back. When we think about telehealth, we think mainly adults or senior citizens. But for me, I'm always focused on the, the child, you know, the, the young adults, because we know gambling is very addictive. And there are studies and research that has shown um, that repeated exposure to gambling, um, it creates this uncertainty and produces those last changes in the human brain. So there's an effect on the brain. Um, there are studies that suggest that they have effects um, similar as drugs would on, on the brain. And although we um, have young gamblers, I think our ages 18 to 20 are restricted from casino gambling um, aboard riverboats until they reach the age of 21. But I think that we need to educate them much younger than that so that they can understand the risk of gambling. So it could be more of a deterrent from them getting even started in gambling. It may be something they hear like Senator Stallman said, those bus rides, you, you hear that your grandma goes on a bus ride or another family member and you think it's okay, it's leisure fun, but we need to let those young kids know the, the dire restraints of gambling, what it could cause on their life as young adults into adulthood um, so that we can address it at those the teen age. Um, and, and because they're now becoming one of the highest risk groups for developing those gambling problems, I think our uh, services in telehealth should also include those young adults. That's a great point. Um, and you know, one thing we, we tell, we've talked about casinos, we've talked about video gaming terminals, but we have not talked about sports betting. So during the mm -hmm. pandemic back in June, 2020, sports betting on your mobile device became legal here in Illinois. And we've seen a huge increase in that, right? So um, obviously March madness, everyone's talking about that. Now my Loyola Ramblers lost, very sad. Uh, but, uh, but we're still all very focused on that. Um, and I think, you know, the sports betting, again, is another big revenue, but what do you think we can do to better regulate that and monitor that? If there's anything that we can do to better regulate that and monitor that. And I mean, to Senator Lightfoot's point, you young, young adults are used to being on their phone all the time, video gaming, you know, they're playing their Xboxes or whatever kids do now. I don't know what the right, what the right machine is but this is very similar. And so I was wondering if all of you could share some thoughts on that. Uh, 
I, I can't say that I know um, all of the details that went into the um, sports betting legislation. Um, I would imagine that is similar to gaming. And I don't know if um, Senator Starman is aware either. Generally, when it's down into the weeds, it's pretty much the legislators that's carrying the legislation. But I would imagine it to be um, on the same playing field as uh, casinos and the other um, facilities that are pretty much on in every strip mall <laughs> and in every community that I have. So I don't know if I can really add to what more can be done other than giving them the same restrictions um, that we would on um, the other gambling um, opportunities that are available. Thank you, Senator Lightford. Anybody else? I guess I can just add that the new uh, gaming bill did call for the creation of a soft exclusion list for sports bettors, similar to what we have for casinos. So the idea, obviously, that if people feel like they have an issue, uh, they can exclude themselves from participating in this type of gaming. So that's probably one thing that comes to mind. Uh, protections are already in place for casinos, for sports bettors, that same uh, level of protection will be available as well. You know, sports betting is, is an interesting situation. I think we're seeing it has been uh, relatively popular up until this point uh, during the past year. But I, I would venture to guess that most of those people who are playing have already been playing for a long time. Uh, it's always been very popular through the black market. So I guess there's a question, how many additional problems that will cause because people have been doing it for a long time uh, through overseas firms and again, through the black market. I think some of the early data has shown that there has been a big shift from, from the black market to legalized sports betting, such as we have in Illinois. And so I think you can make a, a policy argument, perhaps, that it's better for players to take part in legalized sports betting, which has regulation and, and some consumer protections, and then what people have been doing up until this point. And of course, that's more money for the state. It's just going to some overseas firms. So um, I know there's concern, obviously there's this new form of gaming out there, but you know, this is, is anecdotal, but you know, I've, people have been doing it a long time through the black market. And uh, you can argue that maybe through a more legalized form, uh, if possible, that may be a, a more comfortable situation. But again, it's something we have to monitor. I think the study that you know, DHS want to take will help give us some perspective as far as what that's gonna mean for the state is still relatively new in this state and across the country and what the repercussions may be. And just uh, maybe to echo on a, a point that's been made and I think made earlier, looking at, uh, of course we had casinos, VGTs and now uh, sports betting, an individual who appears under the age of 30 who goes onto a casino has to present an ID. They, their photograph is taken with that ID by uh, IGB and to basically to ensure that no one under 21 is on the floor and uh, and ga gaming and uh you know again having a casino in my hometown since i was 17 years of age i have a pretty good feel for how those uh, operate now with VG vgts there are still some requirements that a clerk at least is going to check and make sure someone's not 21 or is 21 rather when they they enter the the facility or the area that involves gaming, but it, it is a little less because you're not involving a gaming board agent. And then now we have online gaming, which young people can skirt around. Now, of course, to Senator Solomon's point, it's been in existence uh, before we made it legal. So it may have been the young people were doing it even prior to that, which I think goes back to the larger point that we need to be educating, uh, having the resources available uh, to intervene when necessary, make sure the treatment is there. Um, you know, like other problems we see with society and young people, making sure that we're educating them, making sure that we have the resources available to address the issue is important. Yeah. And if I, and if I could. Yes, uh, please. So, so just a couple really quick points. And one, and I, I just to kind of connect dots, um, you know, obviously, um, the, my, the three uh, panelists, senators and, and, and the representative know far more about legislation. And so, you know, that we, I will, we will lean into them to talk about, you know, how that needs to happen. I did want to underscore the point around uh, telehealth though, which is, I think there have been significant gains 
made. And so um, would really want not want to see that rolled back because I think to the points that were just made around, you know, if we want to do uh, some real preventative work, the reality is, is that this virtual intelligence that we're talking about, it's here to stay. And so what we know that that is just going to continue uh, to, to develop. And so I think, you know, uh, context is important. And so the, the work that we can do, particularly with young people around financial literacy um, and, and how we then um, educate and inform around financial, financial literacy and the impact that decisions make around, you know, so if you're using your credit card for this, if you are running up debt, it then impacts the social determinants of health in terms of, you know, your ability to be able to rent an apartment, to purchase a home, and it could impact employment. And so, you know, to, to be really explicit in making those connections uh, for young people early, I think is part of the strategy that we um, will uh, be, you know, continue to be involved in, in terms of, uh, from a, um, a real uh, prevention perspective. And then I think that, uh, you know, what we also uh, want to do is, uh, is, is to just speak to kind of the, you know, kind of that whole total family unit. And so uh, while it's important to make sure that we're giving information uh, to young people, I think it's also important that we're, you know, giving this information candidly to, uh, believe it or not, seniors as well uh, around how the behavior is impacting and how they're modeling uh, for young people so that, again, we are being explicit around, you know, how those uh, behaviors the, can, can be uh, connected and that you can actually get, you know, better how, uh, outcomes because people tend to listen to obviously those people uh, who they trust and know more. And so I think that that's also some of the information uh, to the points that were made earlier that you will see come uh, kind of out of that final uh, report, uh, the, the, the final gambling report when it's, when it's generated. So, you know, everybody's comments obviously are right on point. It's about education and outreach. And I think that's one of the reasons why the grant is focused on both treatment, direct treatment, and a big part of our grant is really about getting the word out. Um, the more you talk about it, uh, the less stigma there is. Um, you know, gambling disorders is called, called the invisible illness, but it is an illness of the brain, just like all other substance use disorders. And it's a lot harder for people to notice um, because you're not ending up in the hospital overdosing, for example, but it's a silent, silent, long-term um, negative impact. So we have about 15 minutes left and I do wanna um, allow, if, I'm not sure we have, I think we just had one comment, but you know, one of the things that, um, and I don't know if people know this, is the reason that we have the grant to pay for treatment is that uh, gambling disorder services is not covered by Medicaid. Um, people with commercial insurance are able to access treatment uh, under the diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, another gap that we see, and Anita Pindur has talked about this a lot, is we don't have what we call, you know, level 3.5 residential treatment for people who only have a gambling disorder. If you have a co-occurring, you know, you also have a substance use, and then you have a gambling disorder, we can serve you. So those are two you know, big areas where we do have some gaps. Um, uh, currently, uh, providers like Gateway and others that are able to benefit from the grant, we draw down on the grant to provide direct treatment because Medicaid doesn't cover that. So just maybe some parting thoughts on that um, and, you know, kind of your reactions to those things. And, and, and I think you all spoke to this, but, you know, the youth piece, 6% um, of college students in the United States have some kind of gambling disorder. Um, which is a big number. So, you know, um, I just kind of gave you three big things. So the gaps of Medicaid, residential, and then sort of the youth prevention. Who would like to start just on some final comments on those three areas? And by the way, you've all been really good sports because I sent you all these questions and then I just sort of, I think asked two of them and then I was a teacher. So that's what happens. <laughs> So I'll take a stab at it first. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that um, there's always room for improvement. 
there is always room for expansion on how to best address needs via through the budget process or community organizations such as the way back in that does a wonderful job in the gateway foundation continue to give legislators suggestions and recommendations on how to because you're the ones that are really out there in the community boots on the ground providing these services informing uh, residents what the needs are and if you inform us on how to help you deliver your product better, right? How can we be a tool for you? I think we'll be able to know exactly where we need to go to tighten existing laws that we have on the books or expand programs that have proven to be beneficial but not have had enough resources to really expand it and get it out there uh, to grow. So I know there's the SHARE program um, and the problem, I think it's Problem Gamblers Registry System you know, how can we send more people to um, receive these supports other than, again, to do what we're doing, having these events, hosting events, talking to subgroups, actually bringing former gamblers on who have a testimony and who could talk to um, other uh, others that are at risk who may have not identified themselves as addicted to the um, gambling as a problem, but maybe someone who has started out the same way um, can tell their story of how it began to take effect on them um, and for them to get help right away um, in, in perhaps a, a testimony that could talk about loosening this up as a stigma of an addiction. Um, and, and so just creating those ways to get the additional professional help that's needed. Um, so when we talk about Medicaid, like Medicaid is a whole another hour, you know, conversation around how to tap into uh, reimbursements um, for these type of services. Um, and so I'd be delighted to get ideas and suggestions from leaders in the field like you all to, to tell me as a legislator and partner with uh, Senator Stottom and a representative on how we can, you know, enhance our existing structures that we have in place through the legislative process. Thank you. That's great. Now, gentlemen, she put you to shame. Let's go. Who's next? <laughs> no, I'll take another, <laughs> take my opportunity, I guess. Uh, and I think, you know, with the fact that it's not covered by Medicaid, uh, those services means we need to reach out to the, uh, our federal representatives and senators to make sure that the state wouldn't bear the entire burden of that cost if we decided to expand those services. Uh, but that's, uh, of course, a larger conversation that needs to occur. Now, as it relates to the youth, that uh, you know, it's really, I'm afraid I'm not gonna have much as by way of a solution to present, but maybe more by way of just uh, expanding on the problem. Uh, you know, I, we talk about stigma, there is a stigma that relates to uh, getting treatment or seeking treatment. And we have, as a society, I feel like, work to uh, chip away at that stigma for all sorts of uh, treatment avenues that are there. But then there's also another stigma that has gone away and uh, maybe stigma is not the right word, but a, a social barrier to gambling and the way it's viewed in society. I mean, there, I remember, you know, of course, maybe a product of where I grew up, but as a, a young person, you know, gambling was viewed in a certain way. And now it is so prevalent and there is really not anyone saying it is uh, unacceptable. In fact, it's a form of entertainment. So to a young person, then they look at that as something that has potentially no problem or no uh, cost to it. They just view it as a form of entertainment that they would like to engage in. So it goes back to a lot of the points that have been made by the director and the senators about uh, the education piece that is gonna be so important for young people for them to understand uh, that you know, there are potential costs, not only to society, but to a person when they engage in gam and gambling, that go beyond just the loss of the dollar, whatever you have to wager, that uh, expand beyond that. And that's what makes it so difficult. Uh, we're not gonna get away, uh, you know, gaming is gonna be part of our society and was before it was legal, obviously, and will continue to be. It's, it's a matter of us trying to fill in those areas where we can. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just add that uh, reiterating an earlier point, I think the state needs to do a better job of making sure that addiction treatment and therapy opportunities are funded 
probably all across the state, wherever there may be people who have a gaming addiction problem and find out what gaps there are in insurance and services. Uh, I think in the past, the state hasn't done as good a job and hopefully with the new gaming expansion bill, which greatly increase funding for the services uh, will make uh, headroads into that situation. But again, you know, a, a key point here has been just, I think it's great that we're finally studying problem gaming. You know, it's been what, 30 years since we've actually looked into the situation and trying to get more insight into expansion and what it means to the state, especially for vulnerable populations. Until you study the problem, you don't know exactly what those problems are and potential resolutions. So that's why I think that study is so important so we can maybe finally get a handle as far as what's happening out there on the ground. You know, how, how well are self-exclusion lists working? Uh, should they be expanded to BGTs, for example? That's just one area that's not covered. So, and you know, repeating another point that you guys are on the front, on the front line. Uh, you see what's happening on a daily basis, how lives are being impacted. We need that information. So please share with us, let us know what's going on in, on the front line. So from a legislative perspective, we can react and try to address those needs as well. Thank you, Senator Sam. That's such a great point. You know, one of the challenges for me and for others who get asked these questions is that we don't have enough research because it wasn't viewed as an addiction or a disease of the brain. And so we haven't really studied it as much as we need to. So sometimes it's hard for us to answer those questions and give numbers uh, because there's limited research on that. Director Jones, if you wanna make a comment and I do have a question for you that just came in. So go ahead, Director Jones. Sure, just a couple of comments. And I just wanna pick up on uh, where the sentiment uh, Stedelman left off, which was that I, I do believe very much, uh, he's absolutely correct around you know, uh, the, the study and then being really, um, uh, deliberate about including those evidence-based practices and those and that evidence-informed uh, kind of treatment. You know, uh, once we once we get, uh, gain the information, the other piece is that you know to your question, uh, Dr. Garati, around just youth. I also think that you know one really practical thing that we can do that sometimes I think we may misstep about, and that is really go to the youth themselves to get their their youth voice. Um, and so when you go and get the youth voice for them to say, here's what we feel will work for us, uh, that's a strategy that sometimes, particularly when placed to scale, um, ends up making um, a huge difference. And so we, we believe that, again, partnering with people with lived experience, and sometimes that lived experience is really about being a young person saying that this is what works for me. And so we, we think that that's really important. And then I just you know, I also think as it pertains to, you know, just, um, you know, just uh, parity generally, that that's, a, you know, we also have to continue to look at kind of, you know, where are things around parity and, and what's really being implemented consistent with, you know, what's already kind of in the uh, legislation. And then um, finally, one piece that I think that, you know, the, that um, DHS is, is committed to, and we had mentioned earlier, and that is, um, you know, uh, expanding the number of providers, and particularly in some cases, those uh, those providers who uh, generate or provide prevention services to make sure that you know we are working with them so that you know there are, there's more availability availability across the entire state. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Astrid. I'm sorry, I'm going to say the name, last name correctly incorrectly. Redatus, um, the question is for Director Jones. What criteria was used to identify problem at risk gamblers targeted for the assessment? I believe they're referencing the study. Yes, yes. So it, it was really, um, it, there was uh, some of the criteria involved um, self identification. So there were, um, as, as they were, um, as some of the individuals were surveyed. They were asked um, if they had engaged in gambling in the last 30 days, and so uh, they um, they you know they again they through uh, the process of kind of um, self uh, confessing uh, that that was kind of part of the issue, um, and then there was some um, other um, criteria uh, that we that the the entity that conducted the survey also included uh, that then uh, factored into kind of the algorithm, if you will. Um, there's another question. I am not qualified to answer this question and I don't know that anybody can and, and I'll tell you why it's a hard question to answer. It says, how many certified gambling councils are there in Illinois? 
So it's a little difficult to answer that because, um, for example, I'll use Gateway. Everybody, when we got the grant, we had to identify staff that would complete the 30 hour training to be able to provide services. There's some people who are in private practice who also provide gambling disorder services, but I don't know, Director Jones, can you answer that question? I don't, I don't know if that's a question any of us can answer. Um, so what I, the way I would answer it, and, it, and, and to your point, um, I, you know, it's, it's not um, in its entirety, you know, so we know that we have kind of across uh, Illinois, 25 organizations that are kind of, you know, certified uh, to provide gambling services. Now, to your point again, Dr. Grady, there are probably individuals beyond that that have completed kind of training. And so what the universe is, I, I can't speak to, but again, would say that we know at least at minimum there are 25 kind of organizations. Right. And I think the more we focus on telehealth, the more accessible I think treatment is going to be too. Um, and depending on, you know, there's so many factors of the person's insurance, what their background is, how the, how the disorder is manifesting itself. But that's a really, it was a, it was a good question. And then the last question, I'm sorry, these questions are from Arlene Miller. Um, is the state uh, considering rework, reworking the current self-exclusion law? Um, some of you kind of alluded to it, but I'm not sure there's an answer. Well, the new, as I mentioned, the new gaming expansion bill does include self-exclusion abilities for sports bettors. They're already in place for casinos. Uh, the one area that there's not been that regulation is for VGTs. And that's, that continues to be a topic of discussion. You have 7,000 operators out there, right? You know, how realistic is it to implement that type of regulation across 7,000 different uh, facilities or, or, or you know, venues? I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but I think from a logistics standpoint, it's much more difficult. But I think, you know, that's one thing maybe the study can, can uh, shed some light on. But um, as far as that scuff exclusion, that does include the sports betters, which is the new expansion, one of the new expansion areas in the state. Okay, thank you. We have about three minutes left. Does, uh, first of all, panelists, you all did a great job. Does anybody have any final comments that you wanna share before I close it out? If, if I could underscore the, uh, the point that uh, Leader uh, Lightford made in the beginning, which is we just want to make sure uh, that people are aware of we know the feeling.org, that that a website is available, that the uh, gambling hotline at 1 800 426 2537 or again 1 800 gambler is available. And then people can also feel free to text IL. GAMB to 53342, uh, just to know that those resources uh, are available uh, to all um, the uh, Illinois residents. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of everyone, and we had over 70 people sign up for this, so that's really exciting. Um, I can't see the number right now, but thank you all for joining me and joining TASC way back in and Maha in this um, virtual webinar series. This was the first, so for those of you who are listening, we have three more, one this afternoon, one tomorrow, and one on Wednesday. Um, we wanted to both do kind of a policy and, and have the conversation around what we can do with our partners, our legislators, our elected officials, but the other sessions are more focused on some practical how-to. One of the biggest things that we deal with at Gateway is often it's a family member who calls us, not the person who needs the treatment. And so really making sure that you talk to everyone. You know, if you have a loved one where you think something is off, you don't know what it is, but you think something is off, go with your hunch, <laughs> probably something is off. And just remember that addiction is a disease of the brain and we can't judge people, but we have to get them help. So always going towards your loved one as I'm doing this out of love. I'm doing this because you're my family member or my dear friend and I don't wanna see you um, get hurt. You know, so those, that's really important. And that also destigmatizes it and helps everybody understand that this is a disease of the brain and like any other illness needs treatment, um, not to shut, put it aside. Um, I think we are wrapped up. Uh, I wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us on behalf of my other partners and colleagues. Have a wonderful day and we hope that you found this useful and engaging and until next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it.